Okay, so we had our midterm. I'll get the grades back for that next Tuesday. And so we just have oops, two and a half weeks left in the term. So today's going to be sort of a combination. Uh, we're looking at chapter eight. Chapter eight's got kind of two parts. Uh, pressure vessels, first section, 8.1. which is kind of a unique uh, loading scenario that's encountered uh, in industry. So we will kind of want to look at that and it'll kind of round out all the various types of loading that we have on typical structures. And so then second part of today, we'll dig into combined loading where, you know, we've looked at normal forces, we've looked at shear forces, we've looked at bending forces, Look at torsion forces. And in general, we've kind of looked at them in isolated cases where you've got a member that's just tension only. You've got a beam that's just bending. Um, and now, what about if we have multiple loadings occurring simultaneously? So that's kind of what combined loading is. And that combined loading leads directly into kind of next week the stress transformation and failure theories. Because ultimately, what we really want to know is, based on the stresses this member is experiencing, is it going to fail or not? And so we kind of started looking at that back in you know, chapter one, chapter two, with stress, the idea of allowable stress. And so it's relatively straightforward that if you have one type of stress, you know, we've got an axial load only. Pulling on it. And it makes sense for that single type of stress that we have, it needs to be less than the yield for sure. And we often use a safety factor to establish the stress as a consequence. But what about if the normal force is 75% of yield and the shear stress is 50% of yield? Okay. You know, what's the combination effect of those types of stresses? So that's really what we're going to dig into next week with the failure theories. Um, and in order to get to the failure theories, we first have to talk a little bit about stress transformation. So that's kind of a little bit the roadmap of where we are now, where we're going. And then the last week of the term, we'll talk about beam discharge. Okay, so that first part of chapter eight with pressure vessels, our objectives here are identify hoop stress and longitudinal stress, the two different types of stresses on, that occur on members. And then just calculate those normal stresses that are de developed inside. So that's all we're kind of wanting to tackle here. This will hopefully be a relatively short part. But so pressure vessels are kind of a unique scenario. Like typically we've got members, you know, it might be columns, might be beams, might be axles um, that we're using in different elements of designing. But in some industries, we have vessels that uh, we fill up with some sort of fluid, some sort of gas, it's pressurized. And that creates stress on the shell of those vessels that are consuming that pressurized liquid or gas. And so broadly, we sort of divide these into two sort of groups. These are actually cylinders that are long uh, cylinders. And those develop two types of stresses, the, the hoop stress and the uh, cylindrical stress. And then the spherical just has one type of symmetrical. Has anyone ever been in a pressure vessel? Yeah? Hyperbaric chamber. Anyone else? Submarine would count. There's another industry that's a type of pressure vessel. Airplanes. So it's been a, 
been in the news lately, right, with the Alaska Airlines and the door plug or the plug on the side of the wall popping out. So these are just a type of pressure vessel where you've got a pressurized cabin, low pressure outside of the aircraft, and develops stresses on that skin of the aircraft. So we're going to dig into the types of stresses that we get in these types of So we're going to look at cylindrical ones first. It's uh, kind of the more complicated because there are two types. For this to be valid, what we're going to look at, we have two assumptions. One is that that uh, thickness of the shell is going to be much, much, much smaller than the radius of the cylinder. And that's important because if you start to get it thick, then you could develop some, uh, some additional stresses that we're going to collect. But when you've got thin walled shells, uh, this one dominant stress in each direction is what we want to look at. And then we're just going to assume that the stress that's in that thickness of our shell is going to be uniform across its thickness. So the nomenclature we're going to have here, we've got hoop stress and longitudinal stress. So if we zoom in and look at our cylinder, what we're going to do is we're going to take a differential element and we're going to look at the stresses that occur in each direction. And the stresses that are going to occur due to this pressure inside are only normal forces and they occur on both faces, both uh, in the, uh, the hoop direction going around the cylinder in that longitudinal direction of the cylinder. So these are just sort of normal stresses. And because of the assumptions we sort of made and the sort of unique scenario of the, the pressure uh, inside, there are no shear forces. So all we get are these normal forces, sigma one, sigma To derive what sigma 1 and sigma 2, we take these two sections. So if we look at the hoop stress first, we're going to slice down vertically through our element, and then slice longitudinally through our element. We get this little differential element here. And so we've got the, the pressure that's acting inside the vessel, and we've got Sigma one, that is the stress in the shell, top and bottom there. For developing the longitudinal stress, we just sort of slice through our element. We've got pressure acting all along that cylinder. And so that's how we're going to look at and develop the stress of that cylinder. So if we look at Sigma 1 first, we've got that slice cross-section, and if we have our coordinate system so that we've got, you know, this kind of direction right here being our sort of x direction, so the sum of forces and the x equal to zero. We have the, the pressure that's acting, and it is in uh, the x direction, its thickness <laughs> dy and it acts all over the full diameter, so two times the radius. And then that normal stress that's developing in the shell of our element, sigma 1 times its thickness, dy and t. And we've got that two of them top and bottom. One thing uh, that always confused me a little bit when I first kind of looked at this diagram is just how does pressure act on a surface? The 
Yeah, it, so it it's acts on the surface and it acts perpendicular to the surface. And so if we look at, I'll just draw in two dimensions here. If we look at you know, this slice through our element and we've got pressure, you know, our pressure is acting perpendicular to the surface all along it. But each one of these pressure elements has sort of two types. We can break it down into the X component and the Y component. And when you go from the top of your element to the bottom, the top half, the Y forces are all pointing up. The bottom half, the Y forces are all pointing down. They cancel out. So there's no net resultant Y. Right down here, the x component is zero. And right here, you know, the x component is exactly p. And then all along the rest of this surface, it, it's kind of varying, right? Between zero and p. But the reality is we are acting on this arc length surface, and the length of that arc length is much, much greater than the diameter of our cylinder. And so if you actually were to integrate that x component over the arc plane, the net result you would get would just be a p acting in the x direction for the whole length. Well, so the pressure is wanting to kind of push out on, on the vessel in all directions. And the only way that that can be counterbalanced is if the stresses that are developed in that tube are kind of pulling, pulling it in counter. And so the, the, the direction of that sigma 1 P stress is going to be opposite. So uh, that's kind of just fundamental theory. Uh, so we've got that sum of, sum of forces in the x direction equal to zero. Once we simplify that equation, it all boils down to this one expression that we've got sigma one is equal to the pressure times the radius over the thickness of the wall. So. That's sigma one, and so that's that hoop stress for a cylinder. If we section longitudinally through our member, look at sigma two, which is going to be the stress in that wall. It's going to balance out um, that pressure that's acting over the whole circular. Sum of forces in the y direction, y direction being the length of the cylinder. What we find once we evaluate that expression is that sigma 2 is equal to the pressure times the radius over 2t. So the net takeaway there is that sigma 2 is one half sigma 1. Sigma 1 was PR over T. This one's PR over 2T. So it's 1 half S sigma 2. So uh, recognizing that, that sigma 1 is the dominant force, when you look at cylinders that exceed their pressure, they're always going to fail in that heat stress scenario. And this is the type of failure that you'll see. Explode that through that heat stress.
If we look at the spherical vessel, we section through it, it's symmetric everywhere, and the pressure that we get on that sphere is analogous to the pressure that we get on the longitudinal direction for the cylinder. And so we get PR over 2T, and that is going to be in both directions. So the sphere has uniform pressure in both normal directions. It doesn't have a, a dominant one. So the sphere is going to be a more efficient um, geometry. We're going to have less stress in our shell if we were to uh, choose that as an option, which is a function of whether or not that shape works for the volume of fluid and gas that we're going to store. So this kind of unique scenario for pressure vessels boils down to those two scenarios. If we have a cylinder, the dominant one is going to be the hoop stress, and that normal force is PR over T. And if we have uh, either a cylinder or a spherical, and looking at that longitudinal stress, um, it's half sigma one is PR over T. Questions about that basic scenario? So this is just kind of a unique case because we've got some elements that we designed that fall into these sort of pressure vessels. So another example of a pressure vessel here, this would be like a little cam, we got a little piston going in and we're wanting to determine what force P can be exerted such that the stress in the cylinder doesn't exceed three megapascals. So the basic information we're told here, each piston has a radius of 45, cylinder has a wall thickness of two millimeters. So this 47 millimeters you see there, that's the outer radius. So the radius inner is 45, the radius outer is 47. Thickness there is two. Our sigma allowable there from that is three megapascals. We want to use this information to first determine. Uh, the pressure and to determine piston force. So with that, those two equations, sigma one, sigma two, we've got enough information. You should be able to evaluate that and determine that piston force. So why don't you take a couple minutes and work on that first problem?
I'm stuck on calling for the pressure. everyone sounds like they got the the pressure so the governing equation is going to be sigma 1 is p r over t we want to solve for p so i'm just going to rearrange this equation that p is equal to sigma 1 uh times t over r and we know that sigma 1 we're setting that equal to sigma allowable which is our 3 megapascals so our 3 megapascals is sigma 1 we know our thickness we know our radius so we can plug in there to determine the pressure so we have 3 MPA, thickness of 0 0.002 meters over the radius of 0 0.045 meters. Yeah, you could do 2 millimeters over 45 millimeters. Units just cancel out there. So the pressure is equal to sort of convert to, to kilopascals, 133 kilopascals. So why did we choose sigma one?
Yeah, it's going to fail first uh, because you know the equation for sigma two pr over two t that's always going to be smaller. And so, you know, if you were to solve for this one, the pressure you would get here would be two hundred and sixty-six. But you're never going to reach that two hundred sixty-six because as soon as you reach one hundred thirty-three, then the cylinder is going to fail in heat stress. So, part two. So, part two, I'm going to draw my sort of longitudinal section here. Here's my longitudinal section. I've got the force in the piston that we're calling P. And then we've got the pressure that is acting on that circular face of the piston. I don't know, it's just the nomenclature that the um, here, I'll just do the pressure. You know, pressure just acting everywhere perpendicular inside that cylinder. So we can just sort of isolate and look at one of these. So one of these, this has to be the equilibrium. So we've got uh, force in the piston. Is going to be equal to this pressure that's acting on the space and the area that's acting on is that circle. So, sum of forces in the longitudinal direction has got to be equal to zero. Therefore, we've got, maybe I'll do a uh, Maybe I'll do P force to you know, clarify this nomenclature a little bit. It's got to be equal to the pressure times area. The pressure is what we just solved for, 133 kilopascals. And the area is area of our circle, so it's just pi times our radius squared. So we solve for that, we get the force in the piston equal to 848 newtons. Yeah, so yeah, so the, the R nomenclature here is the, the inside radius. Uh, we don't use the outside radius, but the, the statement says 45 and the figure says 47, and so I thought that was confusing. So, so I just kind of wrote, wrote there to sort of clarify, well, what's 45 and what's 47? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it would make more clear for this figure just to sort of say, you know, 45, because that's what the, the radius is there and the thickness is 2. And it would make more sense just to call that sort of N instead of P. But, yeah. So all of these scenarios, if you have a, a vessel that's got pressure sort of boil down to those two equations. So it's just kind of recognizing the stress that's acting here is internal pressure. You've got a cylinder or a sphere, and then pull that correct equation, PR over T or PR over TT, depending on the scenario, and sort of solving, solving with that. Oh, I turned it off when I started warning. Thank you. Down? So we'll have an example on the, the homework here, but uh, yeah, these are kind of unique scenarios, so it's, it's good to understand uh, if you have pressure vessels, the type of forces you have, but um, they, these are kind of isolated cases, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, so we're going we're gonna to stop there and then dig into the next section that is objectively a little bit more All right. So our next section, combined loading, this is just where we're going to take the isolated cases we've looked at before and start to look at the scenario, well, what if we have multiple cases occurring at the same time? What is, happens to our stresses in the membrane? And the short answer is that because we are working always elastic region of our member that we can just look at these as a series of load cases. We've got load case one being normal force, load case two being bending, load case three being torsion, and we can just solve for them individually because that's easier and then just add them together at the end. The critical thing so add them together is back at the beginning when we talked in chapter one about stress. We said it all boils down to two types of stresses. You've got normal forces that are acting the section your member. When you look at the face, normal stresses are acting longitudinally perpendicular to the face, either tensile or compressive. And shear forces are acting in that cup. And so we can add like forces. So if you've got a tension force occurring, that's a normal force in our member. We've got a bending force in our member. That's compressive and tension. Those normal forces, if it's like, we can add together. You can't add together a normal force and shear force. This is two different. So that's the, the complicated part is just kind of break it down into its pieces. So our objectives here illustrate normal and shear stress variations on a cross section, see the various types, and then just quantify the total effect by adding together those individual load cases. So there are lots of scenarios where this occurs. So one, one example here, we've got this, this bridge column. And in the sense, if you have a column that has your beam member directly over top, due to gravity load, it's going to just experience axial only. So it'd just be a compressive force on that column. But here, based on you know, flight constraints, most likely you probably have like a, a railroad or you know, a building or something down here that couldn't put the column where you wanted it to be. So you had to offset the column, but you still need to be able to support your bridge girder. And so there's 
throw this big sort of cantilever beam off the top of your column, but obviously it's going to cause bending in that column. So you've got bending of the column, and you still have the axial load, the weight from that girder that you're holding up to. So you've got two cases. You've got axial load, P over A. You've got bending due to that offset cantilever beam. To analyze this, you just break it into the two components, the P over A component. You just have whatever that axial load is, that, that reaction under that girder spread uniformly over the cross section, P over A. So that's what we looked at in chapter four. Chapter six, where we're dealing with moment. You know, here we've got that axial load there, the centroid longitudinal axis of our member here. You've got a perpendicular distance there, D. So you've got your, you know, P times D is going to be your, your moment. It's acting on your cross section. What is the stress? going to be on a cross-section due to moment? This is going to be my over i. Basically chapter 6. And so y is 0 at the neutral axis, so there's no bending stress right there at the neutral axis. Linear function, max compression stress, outer edge, max tensile stress, outer edge, and for a symmetric cross section, those max values are going to be equal in magnitude, just off direct, opposite direction. We get the combined effect from axial P over A and bending and Y over I. Add them together because these are like forces. These are both forces that are acting perpendicular to the cross section. If we look on this left edge, we've got a compressive force and a tension force. So on this outer edge here on the left, we're going to have to subtract this compressive force from the tension force because the net force is acting. Net force is acting on this space is going to be tension because it's greater, but it's going to be less in magnitude than we had for the bending stress alone. On the opposite side, we've got compression and compression. So those are added 3.75 and 11.25 to get our 15 megapascals. And then it's just a linear function. Between those. Just very linearly from 7.5 tension to 15 megapascal tension. Questions on that example? So that's all we're doing in this chapter. Just taking those. Components we had chapter four and chapter six, those are both normal stresses occurring perpendicular to that cut face. We had two types of shear forces. We had chapter seven, our bending shear, our direct shear, being VQ over IT. Back on chapter five, where we had uh, torsional moment to the circular shafts. That was uh, the torsion times the radius over polar moment of the cut face. So those are both shear forces, and shear forces are just forces that are occurring in the plane of the cut face, but 90% of the time, we just have one of these, not both. There are unique cases where we can have both. 
But 90% of the time, we just have a, a certain type of shear. This example we are just looking at For the gravity load only, do we have shear? Yeah, so you're going to have shear in the um, cantilever beam here. For sure, you've got the P force acting down. So you're going to have that constant P all the way over here. That constant P translates to the vertical member that ends up being your normal force, uh, axial force in the member. So, due to the gravity load only, like this, this ends up being a, a unique case where we just have our member that's loaded in, in constant sort of moment, there's a point moment at the end. So that P times V just ends up being a point moment. And due to gravity load only, there's actually not uh, a lateral force that's not here per se. In reality, this is a column, it's outside, it's going to have wind forces acting on it, so it is going to have an adverse load acting here if you think of the real load of shear. But just due to the gravity. Okay, so we've got uh, two types of shear forces, but generally speaking, most common scenarios, we just have one. And then, you know, what we just looked at with chapter 8.1, pressure vessels. Pressure vessels, those are normal forces. And, you know, when we look at our cross-section right here, we've got our sigma one being in that hoop direction and sigma two being in the longitudinal direction. In a hypothetical sense, if we had a pressure vessel that was also beamed and had some bending forces, which Face would the bending forces occur on? So, if if this also was a bending member, and we had uh, M Y over I bending stresses, would those bending stresses be occurring on this face or this face? This face. Yeah, either side here. Yeah, they occur, you've got your longitudinal member, and the bending stresses occur on that face that's perpendicular to the longitudinal axis. That's where we get our bending. And so we would have, um, we would add like with like, where we'd be adding those bending forces with the sigma 2. We wouldn't have any bending forces on that sigma. And that's just kind of an important uh, thing to distinguish, too, with the pressure vessel versus beam that we just had, that, you know, if we look at a um, differential element right here, you know, with bending, we just get normal forces, sigma, in that longitudinal face, there is zero normal stress on the opposing face. There's no, your differential element of your beam, there's no normal stress in this direction. The only scenario where we get that is in the pressure vessel we just looked at, where we get that deep stress that develops. Otherwise, the only normal forces we get are in that longitudinal direction 
P over A, tension or compression, or MY over I, depending. So, um, we've got those isolated cases, and we just break them down piecemeal, analyze them each one by one, add them together at the end. And we add together like with like. So the basic procedure is just solve for those internal resultants, calculate the stress of the individual components like we've done in Chapter 4, Chapter 5, Chapter 6, Chapter 7. And if we look at the hypothetical, so these are hypothetical, what are all the types of forces that could be added together in this combined effect? That longitudinal force, we could have a P over A. We could have, you know, this is normal force. This is bending about the horizontal axis. This is bending about the vertical axis that we had in the biaxial bending case. And this is your uh, cylindrical pressure vessel case. In the worst case scenario, you have four types. But generally speaking, the two that we have that occur most commonly together would be these two. But more than likely, when you're combining longitudinal normal forces, it's usually a normal force component and a bending about the dominant. That transverse normal force only occurs in pressure vessels. And then the two types of shear force, you've got your direct shear or beam shear, and you've got your torsional shear. In theory, those um, could occur simultaneously, but more often than not, you just have one or the other. Okay. Any questions about that kind of concept? So this is, again, important in leading into next week, where next week we start to talk about, like, the failure theory. What happens when we have loads of multiple types, normal force and shear force. How do we determine if we have failure? We first need to look and determine how we combine forces together if we've got multiple loads. So we've got a couple examples. I'll kind of introduce this and we can take a break and keep working on the problem. So this one we've got, uh, we want to determine the load P that will cause a maximum normal stress on our cross section at AA of 30 KSI. So we've got this kind of C clamp force being applied on that clamp. And that force is two inches away from the face of our member, and then the cross-section through AA, that is two inches thick, or two inches tall there, a half inch thick. So we want to determine that max mass P. So this breaks into a similar problem to the column that we looked at. We just want to figure out the combined effect Go ahead and uh, take a break and then work on the problem. And we'll go from there.
Yeah, and then for the uh, normal stress, you know, we've got a N over A component. I'm going to just put general form. You know, we could have a plus or minus N over A. We could have a plus or minus MY over I component. Do we have bending about a second axis or just the horizontal axis? Just the one axis. So there's no biaxial bending. There's no uh, MYZ over IY. We don't have to worry about that one. And this isn't a pressure vessel, right? So we can leave off that pressure vessel component. So this is our general form that we've got to struggle with uh, for this problem. And we're just going to set this equal to Sigma allow. So we need to solve for what these internal resultants are based on our problem. So I'll give you a couple more minutes and we'll step through that. All right, I'll go ahead and start to walk through this. So on my free body diagram here, I'm going to draw a couple more uh, dimensions here. So here's my longitudinal axis. This is going to be my, my neutral axis. 
neutral axis is just going to be at the the centroid and you know my my basic cross section here this is the two inches tall and the half inch wide so i've got my centroid right there you know that's my my neutral axis So what is this uh, offset distance from the neutral axis to the location that P is applied? Three inches. We have two inches from the top edge plus half that thickness. So you got three inches from P to the neutral axis. So I'm going to do my sum of forces in the longitudinal direction has to be equal to zero. So that longitudinal direction, I've got minus P plus N is equal to zero. So that normal force resultant is just going to be equal to P. Then I'm going to do sum of moments about the cut face equal to zero. So cut face, I've got my moment at the cut face, M. And then I have a moment due to the force P. So that moment due to force P is just P times that perpendicular distance plus P times three inches is equal zero. So my moment is equal to minus three P. So that minus just means that the moment's in the opposite direction. So if we're setting these stresses n over a and n over i equal to the allowable, what's the worst case scenario? So this one ends up because this is, uh, I drew it in tension, came out as positive, so our normal force is in tension. So this is going to be plus P over it. So if we choose the bending stress that's additive, that is a tensile side, then these stresses are going to add together, and that's going to limit P the most. Because the other scenario, is we choose the compressive side, and these kind of cancel out. So the controlling scenario is where the normal force n over a and the moment my over i are both in tension. I think a couple of uh, confused faces. Let me, um, I'm going to just project out over here. This is my neutral axis. This is my top edge. This is my bottom edge. So if we look at the stress due to N over A, what is that on the profile? Of our cross section going to be. So 
Is it very? Is it uniform? We treat that as just a uniform constant everywhere, right? So it's in tension. It's just uniform everywhere. If we look at the stress due to bending, my over i, I determined that negative sign, the compressive edge is going to be that bottom edge. So this edge down here is going to be in compression. My tension is up here. And how does normal force due to bending vary? Linearly, where is it zero? Neutral axis. So we got zero there. And we just have a uh, linear line. We've got a compressive force, tension force. So it's allowable when you have that top edge where tension, tension, or additive going to be the biggest stress we have is going to be governed by that one. Questions on that concept? It's going to take you into two parts. These two parts are the same type of force, the normal force is in that longitudinal direction. So they're just going to be additive in force type one and additive in force type two. So the n over a expressed in our variables here, this is just going to be p over a. And looking at the worst case scenario where they're additive, plus if I want to choose that max stress on the tension side, I can choose the general form of the equation MC. Oops. Okay, ready? MC over I, right? And the general form of the equation, that's the max stress. So plus mc over i. Set that equal to my 30 ksi. Plug in my uh, values here. So this is going to be p over a. The moment I saw for was 3p. Because kind of looking at the big picture and choosing the scenario where the tensile stress and the bending stress are both additive. So I don't need to worry about positive or negative because I'm looking at big picture and just choosing the case where both are additive. So this negative sign is just telling me which direction is compressive and which direction is tension. So Going to take that magnitude of the moment, 3p times c over i equal 30 ksi. So I'm wanting to solve for p. So I've got p in this expression, p in this expression. These are a variable format, but the area, you know, p times half inch. I, I can solve for P is equal to 12. C is the distance from the neutral axis to the outer edge, one inch. So I can sort of rearrange all those terms. Solve for P. If I factor out my P, I get 1 over A plus 3C over I equal. 30 KSI.
So what's my area? Two inch times half inch, one inch squared. My I is gonna be pH cubed over 12. What's my B? Zero point five is my B. My H is going to be two inch cubed over twelve. Uh, so that is a zero point three 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 inches to the fourth. And what is my C? One inch, right? That's going to be my C. So I can plug and solve. Um, so P is equal to 30 KSI over 1 over 1 inch squared plus 3 times 1 inch over 0 0.333 inches to the fourth. And that three part is three inches. Which is squared on top inches to the fourth, so one over inch squared, three inch units, divide KSI by one over inch squared over the fourth. So we solve for that, and we get P is equal to 3 fifths. Question, yeah. So the centroid is always considered when you section through your members and you look at that graph. Um, so if this shape, uh, it, it's possible you could have uh, a C shape, and they make these as bold shapes for the, the C shaped beams that would be your actual beam member. And you could have it. Um, you know, pointing them that way and have it in bending, and in which case then you'd have to do the solving for the centroid of that C shape. In this case, what we actually have is we've got um, just a rectangular shape that basically has some ejections, cantilever beams off the ends that have that lower part. So it's kind of a little different, but it's sort of similar to that labor column that I looked at where you're just sort of cranking a load on the end of the member. Same thing here, where our member itself is just that two inches tall by half an inch by two inch that's running over the top. You know, if we were uh, wanting to design this whole member, let's say this cross section is constant and we've got the same sort of cross section right there, you know. We certainly could section through our member there and say, what are the resultants on it? You know, so if we were to evaluate that, you know, we've got this um, load that's acting P, and then we would have a you know shear force we'd solve for, normal force moment, these are our, the hypothetical resultants we would have, and based on that projection up there, would we have a shear force? Yes, you know, because that, that shear force is going to be equal to P. Would we have a moment force? Yep, and that moment force is going to vary from zero at the location of P to 
maximum at that corner right here is going to be the three p that we determine. Are we going to have a normal force? No. So we we could run through you know an example you know, looking at the combined effect there for the trajectory on the M two. Does that help clarify a little bit? Question the simple way. So um, if we wrap out this, so we solve for P is equal to three kips. Area was one inch squared. So three over one. This happens to just be three KSI. Normal force component. We do the MC over I. This one ends up being 27 KSI in compression and 27 KSI in tension. So if we look at the final effect on our cross section, plus is equal to the final effect, the top is where they're additive, so the 27 plus the 3, so that's where we get our 30. At the neutral axis now, no longer zero, that's not the best straight line, is it? Okay, it's still a linear profile, but at the neutral axis, we're no longer zero. What are we? got zero plus three, we're at three at the neutral axis. What are we on the compressive side? What number? Got 27 in compression, three in tension gives us 24 in compression, so we've got 24 KSI compression, and we've got 30 KSI tension. So tension, so compression. So we're just taking the two component parts, and we just Add them together. All right, so that problem, believe it or not, was the easier one. Give myself a little bit more space here. So here we've got this assembly. We've got this engine that weighs 500 kilograms. It's hanging from a hook that's two meters out from point C. We've got tendon member DE. The location where DE attaches, so it's got a 30 degree angle there and it's located 0.4 meters up from the neutral axis. And so we're wanting to section our D member at section AA there and determine the state of stress. That E member is just a wide line member, and we're wanting to determine the state of stress at point A, which is at the neutral axis of the beam, and point B here that's at the, uh, the web. So, big picture, I don't worry about the various steps yet, but just thinking about sectioning through our member there, uh, do we think there's going to be a normal force resultant? 
Why? So right here, this member is going to be in tension. Remember EV is going to be in tension. And so that's going to break into its vector components. It's got a, uh, it's got a Y component and an X component of that force. So that X component of the force is going to load our member in axial. That's going to be the N over A component. Are we going to have bending? Yep, we're going to have bending. So that normal force equation, sigma equal to, I'm just going to write general form, plus or minus N over A, plus or minus MY over I. So for normal force, that's what we've got. And then for shear force, are we going to have shear point A? So we're going to have shear. Is that going to be uh, beam shear or torsional shear? Beam shear, right? That's going to be our VQ over IT. Is there any torsion in this scenario? What's that? Correct. Yeah, if, if, if this were off-center from the beam, then we could have torsion for sure. But in this case, yeah. So big picture, these are the two equations we have to wrestle with, is that we've got the normal force has those two components, normal and moment. Shear has just the one component due to mean shear. And so step one, we need to solve for uh, Member force in DE. Once we solve for that, we can section it AA, and then we section at AA and solve for internal. Resultants. Once we know those internal resultants, we'll know N, we'll know M, so we can calculate component stresses. Step four, sort of add similar stresses to get combined effects. So that's basically the roadmap. So let's use a time remaining to kind of work on uh, parts one and two, and then the rest will probably bleed into bleed into after class.
How can we solve for member uh, force DE? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, the way this is kind of detailed in there, it looks like we've got just a single pin there at location. So, so, so this, if this were connected to the member, then that might be a moment scenario, but this here then comes down and has a single pin there that's actually connecting our member. So you just have a single pin right in the middle of the missile axis. So yeah, you can solve for member force DE by doing some of moments about point C. No result, there's no resulting moment at point C because it's pinned. So you just have the moment due to the engine and the existing moment due to member force. the engine right
dx component, which is that 0.4 meter offset. So the moment equation has two expressions, dy and dx. We need to express dy and dx as a function of member force dE times sine and cosine. I'll go ahead and do uh, step one here in the time I've got. So if I draw my free body diagram. So my sum of moments about C equal to zero, about moment due to the engine minus 4.91 kilonewtons times two meters, plus the moment due to the Y component. The Y component is gonna be the force in member DE times the sine of 30 degrees times its distance, six meters. And then I've got plus the x component, and it's plus x because of the direction there. So plus member force FTE times the cosine of 30 degrees times its offset distance, 0 0.4 meters, all equal to zero. Therefore, member force FDE is equal to 2.93 kilonewtons. So if you make it into the uh, dy and dx components, just the sine and cosine there, that is 1.47 kilonewtons and 2.54 Newtons. So that when you draw that section, you can just break those component parts. <laughs> 